Um, okay, so I've got the assignments for Monday on the board here, but just in case y'all can't read it, um, because reasons. Um, so <clears throat> your first vocab quiz is gonna open up on Friday morning, and it'll be open until Sunday at midnight, right? So it'll include stuff from our first session, it'll include stuff that we talk about today. Um, there will not be anything on the vocab quiz that won't be in your notes. Um, and in fact, like you can use your notes to take the quiz, right? You know, it's, it's completely open notes. You can take as long as you want with it. Um, the point is really kind of just to help you, um, like help you with the language to talk about the stuff that we're gonna be discussing in class. Um, so what I want from everybody, right, you're gonna give me um, a paragraph defining the term. You're gonna give me uh, the text to which the term is most relevant and the name of that text author. And then we'll typically go over these um, you know, every week as well, like after the quiz. Now, Monday, I want you to read the first six chapters of Things Fall Apart, um, but I'm not gonna be here on Monday. I have to go to Atlanta for a medical thing. Um, so I will be back uh, Wednesday. So what we're gonna do instead, um, I'm gonna give you a reading quiz that will also be posted on Georgia View. Um, you will complete that by Monday midnight and then we'll talk of we'll start talking about the novel on Wednesday. Okay, so any questions? Everybody good? Everybody clear? Fantastic. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Louise Bennett. Uh, what do you think of these uh, these poems in this essay? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, was a, the the language was a little tough. Oh yeah, a little bit, and then some little bit like I, I could see it offhand, kind of what she read. Yeah, and it, it's it's generally like it's easier to get it if you read it out loud, right? Um, if you sound out the words, it makes a little it starts to make a little bit more sense, right? But um, was there anything um, in particular, like apart from we having difficulty with the language? Um, was there anything particular that you found particular, like especially confusing or especially interesting in what you read? I would say like just based off of like reading the her attitude, I can okay. I can feel her attitude just by the reading it. Okay, and and, and, what, and what what like what kind of attitude is she conveying here? Like what what what, what like what kind of attitude are you picking? Okay, rebellious. Yeah. Okay, good. And very, uh, <laughs> and very defensive. Like yeah. she's, uh huh. She she loves her language, and she's like very okay to how you know other people view, especially you know uh, kind of like those that made us need to change our language, you know, for they uh -huh. have to understand it. So it's like. Yeah, so there, there are two basic things that I want to try to go into today, right? One is to talk like a little bit in very, very brief, like, like very kind of high level summary of the, what's going on with Jamaica historically. Um, and maybe a little bit about how that affects language. And I also want to talk about the linguistic strategies that post-colonial writers often use. Um, and then we can kind of apply that to what Bennett's doing here, right? So let's kind of maybe start with Jamaica. Like, what, what do y'all know about Jamaica, if anything? It's a good place for people to visit for vacation. Okay, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's, yeah, most, most of its economy now is based on tourism, right? Yeah, it's a big tourist destination, you know, because it's warm, it's sunny, right? Nice beaches. And when I think of Jamaica, I read the thing of the accent, like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Jamaica's got a hard accent. The pandemic can break out of it. Uh -huh. my, um, my brother's girlfriend, she's Jamaican, uh -huh. so her accent only comes out when she's mad. Okay. And it's really so, big. and that that's interesting that, that she that she keeps the accent controlled when she's not angry, right? Because yeah. I think that actually gets to some of the things that Bennett is talking about here. Why would somebody feel the need? if they have a strong Jamaican accent, or any strong regional accent, really, to try to keep it controlled. 
some can understand them better. Because sometimes accent, if they mm-hmm. keep it, it's kind of hard to understand people. Yeah. So and once they actually try to keep it under control, it makes it easier for us as English people yeah, to actually well, understand. Yeah, and I, I think that's the key there, right? It doesn't make it easier for another Jamaican to understand, right? You know, everybody's speaking, um, you know, that particular, um, you know, Everybody's speaking Jamaican English, right? Understands perfectly well. Um, you know, whether it's, and even somebody who speaks standard English can get it if they're patient and you know take it slowly, right? But yeah, um, it's largely for yeah for the benefit of people in a culture where, where what we call standard English is the norm, right? And standard English typically is the English that is spoken by society's relative elite, right? So it's usually the English that people in an English-speaking culture aspire to, right? Because this is what important high-status people speak. And if you speak like that, then it helps you if you're trying to move up the social ladder. And do you think that this is a state of affairs that Louise Bennett approves of? to suppress her Jamaican English if she is talking to someone in England or the United States. Mm-hmm. In fact, let's, let's kind of look at this first paragraph of Jamaica language here, right? So I should listen now. My Auntie Rochi said it wild her temper and really vex her for true anytime she hear anybody a style we Jamaican dialect as corruption of the English language. For if that be the case, then them should have called English language corruption of Norman French and Latin and all them tar language what the, uh, them said that English is derived from. So first point she's making here, right? Do you, actually, do you notice anything weird she does with the language here? She goes back and forth, right? Yeah. Do you know what that's called when somebody goes back and forth between quote unquote standard English and um, another English? You may have heard this term before. I'm code Yeah, she's code switching, yeah. And her purpose here seems to be to demonstrate that she's perfectly capable of speaking the Queen's English if she so chooses. This, by the way, like this wasn't original, this wasn't originally a published essay. It was um, a radio talk. Um, she used to have a, a radio show in Jamaica. I think this aired in 1979 initially and wasn't published until 19. Um, but yeah, so one, so one of the things that she's demonstrating here almost right away is that she is perfectly capable of speaking English like an English person. In fact, Bennett is English educated. Right, she got a scholarship. She, you know, she, she got a scholarship to go to drama school in England um, as a young woman, and spent several years studying there. So. She is, so yeah, she's doing some code switching here. Um, what else, what are the, what's the other point, what's the main point she's trying to make in this paragraph? About the relative status of Jamaican English. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Trying to prove a point that it's not it's not corruption of yeah, well, we call something a corruption, right? What do we usually mean if something is a corruption of something else? Yeah, it, it, it's been influenced by something, or right? influenced in a good way or a bad way. Bad. Yeah, corruption is always a bad influence. Right? So it's almost like you, you, you've taken and poisoned something, right? You, you've introduced something nasty into it. And what's the point that she makes about English to try to put back, like about to try to push back on this idea? Twi, Twi is the, the, the name of the language that she's talking about. Yeah, but even go back up a little bit further. Let's, just, let's stick with that first paragraph for a minute, right? What's the fact that she points out about English? So, if something can be corrupted, it must have at one point been pure, right? Does she seem to think English was ever pure? So like English, it seems kind of like a mix of both languages. So it's yeah, kind of yeah, exactly. The point she's trying to make here is that English comes from Anglo-Saxon and Norman French and Latin and these other linguistic influences, right? So <clears throat> it's not like you're dealing with something that has been pure and unchanged since the beginning of time, right? English is all, has already been shaped by these other outside linguistic forces. Right? Who knew here the word derived? English is a derivation, but Jamaica dialect is corruption. What an unfairity. Right? So she's making a joke here, right? You know, what un she's deliberately, you know, instead of using the standard English unfairness, right, she's using Jamaican dialect unfairity. Um, to point out what she regards as the double standard here, right? But she's setting up this opposition between a language that is a derivation and a language which is a corruption. Now, functionally speaking, as she frames it here, is there any difference? between a language that is a derivation and a language that is a corruption. Yeah, not on the level of definition, right? Just how basically other people do it. Yeah, it's entirely about people's feelings. It's entirely about how um, <clears throat> people from the metropolitan culture that is English, right? view people from the colonial and colonized culture that is Jamaica, right? So it's entirely a question of point of view and not a question of actual, like actual difference here, right? So I asked you guys a moment ago like what y'all know about Jamaica and we did note that it is a popular tourist destination, right? Um, what else do you know? What else, if anything, do you know about Jamaica? <laughs> it's going, you know, and honestly, I was like, probably one of the little areas where it's like, yes, you can legally drink at 18. Or 16, I can't remember which age, but one of them you know, ain't got to be 21. The, right, the, the important stuff, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, that's the only thing. Okay, so see, and, and by, by the way, like, just so that everybody's clear, like, I don't know 
is always a perfectly valid answer. <laughs> and like, like honestly, like one of the surest signs of intelligence is admitting when you don't know something, right? Rather than trying to bullshit something. Okay, so Jamaica is, as far as we know, originally inhabited by an indigenous people called the Taino. And in world lit, um, did, did y'all take world lit, either of you? Did, uh, in that class, do you remember if you read uh, Christopher Columbus's letter back to the King of Spain describing you know, what he was finding on his journeys? Yeah, I think that that might be outside of what American lit covers. It's been a while since I've taught. Well, I always used to teach that text, but it's been a long time since I've taught world lit. So um, I don't, I don't know what uh, what Jesse Russell and Lord are doing in those classes now. But um, so the people that Columbus describes uh, in that letter are the Taino. And he essentially describes them as these kind of naive and timid people who would be really, really easy for the Spanish to come and conquer and forcibly convert to Catholicism. And coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally, that is exactly what the Spanish do. In the, in the 16th century. So the Spanish move kind of wholesale into the West Indies, um, start a number of colonies, and enslave the native population. They're convinced there's gold to be found there. And so, you know, they're you know, essentially they're making these people dig mines. Um, they are, you know, using them uh, for other sorts of manual labor. Um, and unfortunately, because the Taino have had no exposure to old world diseases, nor are they accustomed to the conditions of hard labor that the Spanish subject them to, um, most of them die off. So, a new labor force needs to be found. I'll give you three guesses where they find it, and the first two don't count. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, that would be correct. So it's the Spanish who start uh, importing African slaves into Jamaica, um, largely to, yeah, to replace the Taino slaves uh, who had mostly who, who died off due to disease and ill treatment. Right now, in the late 17th century. The island changes hands. It's under British rule from 1670 onwards. Um, and the British know that there is no gold to be mined here, right? Instead, what they find is that this is ideal territory for sugar plantations. So they start growing a lot of sugar cane. And British planters in the colony become very, very wealthy because the European appetite for sugar is, like in the 18th century in particular, just off the charts, right? There is so much demand for sugar, and cane sugar grown in the West Indies is so much better than the beet sugar that you can get in the growth of Europe. Um, that these, yeah, these cane farmers become incredibly wealthy, but they do so through increasingly brutal treatments 
of the slaves who were at these plantations, right? So, you know, um, cane farming is labor intensive, it's physically difficult, um, it requires a lot of cooperation, and it's dangerous. Um, a lot of the process of sugar, like a lot of slaves were permanently maimed, for example, um, in the process of you know, either cutting the cane or milling the sugar. So, over time, the black population of the island dwarfs the white population of the island, right? There are many, many more black Jamaicans than there are white Jamaicans by the early 19th century. On top of this, there are also um, these uh, free black communities gathering kind of like in the center of the island. Um, and you know, places that are difficult for the white planters to access. Um, they call themselves, or are referred to as, Maroons. And the surviving Taino, as far as we can tell, um, joined these Maroon communities and intermarried um, with these communities of free black Jamaicans. And for the most part, these communities are content to be left alone and manage their own affairs. However, they do participate in a number of notable uprisings across the 19th century. And in the 1830s, the British Parliament passes a law outlawing slavery in all of their Western Hemisphere colonies. The same law does not apply to their colonies in the Eastern Hemisphere for reasons we'll probably talk a little bit more about when we talk about India. Um, but yeah, by the 1830s, slavery is outlawed. However, it's outlawed with a number of conditions, right? One, reparations are paid to planters for the law, for the value of the of the slaves they're going to lose, not to the slaves for you know years of hard labor. In addition, the slaves are not immediately set free; they're subject to a seven-year apprenticeship period at the end of which they will, be, they will be supposedly set free, right? Now, we never get to find out if that actually would have happened uh, because the reaction to this law um, is so fierce um, that <clears throat> the apprenticeship period is ended early, right? And people are just going to be set free uh, because the government is afraid of what will happen to the planters and the plantations if unrest is allowed to come. So, in the 1940s, a number of Jamaican soldiers and sailors, in addition to soldiers and sailors from other British colonies, um, serve in the British Army during World War II. while British cities are being pummeled by German bombs in what was called a blitz, right? So the German Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, was flying missions over Britain and dropping bombs on major cities. So at the end of the war, there is a major labor shortage in Britain, right? Because so many men of working age died in the war. And on top of this, you know, there are, you know, in some cities, whole neighborhoods that have to be rebuilt. So from 1945 to 1962,
there's mass integration from the colonies, that is, you know, from the West Indies, from Africa, from India, into the UK. Right, they come on a guest worker. You know, they, well, it's not quite a guest worker program. They're not given temporary visas or anything like that. Rather, a law is passed that declares any citizen of a British dominion to be a British citizen with the right to live in Britain. And so, a lot of people take advantage of this to try to find better jobs. And indeed, there is supposedly a lot of work to be done in Britain, right? The problem being that they did not pass discrimination in employment laws along with, or just discrimination in housing laws, along with this legislation that made these colonized people British citizens, right? So they're getting to Britain. They can only get crap jobs, whatever their, whatever their qualifications are. And in most cities, landlords are basically allowed to refuse to rent to them. This picks up especially in the 50s, right? So the first wave. And by this wave of immigrants is referred to as the Windrush generation. The, uh, the ship, uh, the Empire Windrush, that carried the first boatload of West Indian immigrants um, to, uh, to Britain. Uh, where was I? Right so, right, so the first wave was mostly young, single men who just came looking for work. And a lot of those young single men actually, you know, they, they found homes and jobs in working class neighborhoods, and many of them married English women. It was when whole families started coming over in the 50s that many British citizens started, many you know, British mainland citizens started to become alarmed. Um, one uh, Conservative Party politician, a guy by the name of Powell, um, fulminated that if trends continued as they were, then by 1990, one in ten people living in Britain would be non-white. Which you know, one, so what, right? Um, two, he actually turned out to be right about that. But again, if you if you frame one in ten as a percentage, right? What percentage of the population is what is one in ten? Ten percent, yeah. Which means that by 1990, 90 percent of Britain was still white, right? But for people like Powell, even this ten percent was too much. So this is the general cultural environment in which Bennett is you know, finishing her education, writing her first poems, and like for, you know, forming her identity as an artist, right? 1962, by the way, also marks the year when Jamaica becomes an independent nation. And you know, after her education in a few years in Britain, Bennett goes back to Jamaica, spends the rest of her life there, and becomes a popular television and radio personality. So yeah, she, she had a you know, popular radio show, which this broadcast is taken from. And she was also the host of um, the most popular children's TV show in Jamaica. It was called Ring Ding. And I think she hosted that until her death. But, <clears throat> Let's get 
dissect the language thing and see if we can relate all these pieces of this puzzle to each other, right? So post-colonial theorists argue that there are two basic approaches that a writer can take to standard English, right? They call the first appropriation. Second, abrogation. So one of these words might be more familiar than the other. Um, Amaya, what does appropriation usually mean? What we, when, when we talk about appropriation, what are we usually talking about? I'm sorry that I, I just I single you out because you're really concerned about me. When I think about it, because I know it kind of happens a lot now. Um, like, you know, black hairstyles and stuff, they always say people trying to appropriate it. Yeah. Something that they like trying to take. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of it is, yeah, like, um, there's a, like, it's, you like often like when a white celebrity uh, adopts, you know, some feature of, my, of, of a minority culture, right? Like, yeah, like they, they get a black hairstyle or, um, so, or, you know, some other such thing, where, you know, they, they start making, you know, like making reggae records or, you know, whatever, right? So, yeah, that, and that's usually appropriation in the negative sense, right? So, in the linguistic sense here, when we're talking about post-colonial literature, a writer who appropriates English is taking standard English and essentially making it work them and for their culture, right? So using standard English to express concepts that are not typically associated with England or Englishness, right? Or with kind of like Anglo cultures generally. is kind of the opposite of this, right? So a writer who abrogates English refuses to write in standard English, but instead stands up for whatever their particular native language happens to be. And both of these are really more a matter of degree, right? So, for example, um, there are some writers, uh, like the Kenyan novelist uh, Gugi Watongo, who refuse to write in English at all, right? Since the late 70s, Gugi has refused to write in English. He writes only in his native Kikuyu language. Now, all of his um, novels then get translated into English. Um, because the market for Gikuyu language novels is very small. But you know, he's making a political point by refusing to write in English at all, right? So what Bennett is doing is also abrogation, but it's a less severe form of abrogation, right? Though this you know, might also be because you know, she comes from an island that has a kind of hybridized culture, and whatever original language her ancestors spoke is now lost to her, right? So she's capable of speaking and writing Jamaican English and Standard English, but she chooses to express herself in Jamaican English. Right? So this is also a form of abrogation. OK, so any questions so far? You know, like to once in a while take a minute and make sure everybody is uh, everybody's still with me. So let's maybe take a uh, take a closer look at a little bit more of the Jamaica language essay, and then see if we can apply some of the stuff to some of the poems as well. 
So <clears throat> these next two paragraphs, uh, can I get one of them, uh, one of you to read for, starting with, for Jamaican dialect at start? For the Jamaican dialect, they start with uh -huh. English forefathers. They start. It's okay, just do the best you can. For the African ancestors, to stop talk for them, African language altogether, and learn to talk so so English, because the English forefathers couldn't understand what the African ancestors. Them was was saying to them was saying to them one another with. Don't want to talk. Mm-hmm. In the damn African language to them one another. <laughs> okay, keep keep going. Uh, but we African ancestors then talk the English language with them. Yes, partner and disguise up the English language for for the projects for them. African language is such a way that we English forefathers then still could understand what we African ancestors that was talking about when they was talking to them one another. Okay, so what we've got here, right, is her account of how Jamaican English came to exist, right? And how is she like how did this how does she say this happened? What was the process here? So is she presenting this as an accident or as a choice? Sure. Yeah, she's presenting this actually as a choice, as an example of agency, right? That however the planters try to make their slaves learn English, right? It's okay, fine, like we'll learn English, but you're still not gonna have any idea what we're saying. So yeah, it, it, so it, 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 it's about subversion, right? And it's about using what power you have in a difficult situation. So she turns this into almost like a story in like the, the trickster tradition, right? That yeah, the, the Africans end up tricking the English by complying up to a point. But then, kind of refusing to uh, to full to go the full way, right? So, so abrogation is itself right, not an accident; it's a choice. So, let's take a quick look here at the last two paragraphs which are kind of comparing Jamaican, Jamaican English and uh, Standard English. Um, so, Kara, would you mind reading those two paragraphs for us? Um, where does it start with Starting with Antirochi State of Jamaica Dialect. 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 Antirochi State of Jamaica Dialect.
Nikki Roche said that Jamaican dialect is more direct and and to the point that English, but all like all, all like how English matter was we'll see go away. Jamaican is just said with, and the only time we use more words than English is when we want the next something some sound strong like when they said sent it bada bada up. It sound more expressive than if you say it is better, but most of all most of all we fling we all be bark bangering and tremble them and only left but wanting and that why when English matter see I got stuck by a pickle Jamaican said just said Maka jumped me. Sophie the Jamaican language is not you no know, English language corruption at all. A whole and we you know happens shame ate it like one gal who did go in England go represent the Jamaican folk sound folk song one shift got me got as diesel underwear garment I press I possess it goes saying mama mama did kitchen it, poop it. as mother mother they a praying father all right so What's the point about the difference between Jamaican English and Standard English that she's trying to make here? Basically, like, they're, they shorthand. Yeah. Yeah, she said, yeah, Jamaican English is more efficient, right? You can say the same, you can say the same thing in fewer words. So again,